Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning to Matthias and to colleagues uh, in uh, Europe. And uh, recording, yes, it started. Uh, and uh, it's really my great pleasure to invite a uh, very friendly colleague, uh, Matthias Floyd from Minds. Uh, we know each other from very, very long time and uh, he's an excellent speaker, a great scientist and uh, doing a lot of interesting stuff in uh, nanomagnetism synchronics. We are really privileged to have him uh, in our um, series of webinars that we call as webinar series on synchronics. And I'm really uh, grateful and thankful to Matthias for accepting this kind invitation. So I think in this audience, I'm sure everybody knows uh, Matthias very, very well. But just uh, assuming there may be some new students who may not know him, so for their benefit, I'd like to give a very, very brief and uh, formal introduction about uh, Matthias. So he did his bachelor in uh, uh, University Aachen in, in 2001 uh, and Master of Philosophy, uh, so MSc in Physics from University of Cambridge uh, in 2000. Um, so I think it was a, like a merge program and diploma simultaneously also got in 2001. And, uh, then he uh, continued his PhD in uh, University of Cambridge, uh, where he finished uh, in 2003, the PhD program. And uh, the, uh, uh, then he moved to the IBM Zurich uh, Research Laboratory in uh, um, Switzerland for doing his postdoctoral uh, activity uh, for about uh, two, three years until 2005. He was also a very senior scientist at the University of Constance, where he finished his habilitation in 2008. And he was a leader of an European Research Council starting independent researcher uh, via a grant project between 2008 and 2013. And he became an associate professor uh, for the period 2010 and 2011 uh, in the ETS domain in uh, Switzerland and also PSI, I think it was like a cluster of uh, places. And he became a full professor in 2011 at uh, Gutenberg University at Mainz. And since 2012, he is now working as a director of the Graduate School of Excellence in uh, Mainz. He has uh, like nearly 300 publications with an age factor of 50, many patents, many review papers, very, very informative, interesting review papers, many, many hundreds of <laughs> invited lectures, a lot of money, of course, uh, Matthias has uh, at least like 5 million euros in the last few years. And some distinguished awards and scholarships, uh, which he has got, like IEEE, a Magnetic Society Distinguished Lecturer for the year 2020. He got the Nicolas Kurti Prize for Research in Physical Sciences, Physics Prize of the Academy of Science Göttingen. And then he is the founding member of the Global Young Academy. And, and so on. So there are really lots of uh, hours and fellowships. So with this very brief introduction, we are very much delighted to have you, Matthias, and we are really looking forward to your lecture. So for the new uh, participants, if there is any, I just would like to tell that during the lecture, we don't take uh, questions unless it is super, super duper uh, urgent. Otherwise, we wait till the end. I request you to write either a hi or your question in case your microphone is not working in the chat box. And I assure you that we take almost all questions one by one at the end. So with this, thank you so much, Matthias, and we are looking forward to a lecture. So all yours. Thank you. Okay, great. So welcome, everyone. Uh, firstly, of course, I'd like to thank Subankar and his colleagues for putting together this exciting seminar series. I mean, this is like in these times, a very important way to stay in touch with the community. And of course, I would have loved to meet you all in person. I really hope that one day I can again travel to India in the not so far future and then visit you all and, uh, you know, talk to you also in person and uh, learn about your activities as well. So um, today I'm going to talk about a topic that we've been working on uh, for a couple of years, which is anti-ferromagnets. And since this is kind of an introductory tutorial-like talk, I would like to introduce to you what do we have to do to make anti-ferromagnets useful. 
And for that, we need to be able to implement writing, reading, and transporting SPIN in these systems. Yes, and as Subankar has said, I'm from the University of Mainz, and I also have an affiliation at the Norwegian University of Technology and Sciences in Trondheim. And so today, I'm going to uh, have these three topics of reading antiferromagnets, writing antiferromagnets, and transporting information antiferromagnets. And Subanka said that uh, I'm actually uh, an IEEE Magnetic Society Distinguished Lecturer. So there's one advertising slide. So the IEEE Magnetic Society organizes a number, it's the largest learned society in uh, on magnetism in the world. And it uh, has uh, a lot of uh, interesting activities such as summer schools that it also fully funds. So if you're a student, talk to your supervisor that you can apply to the summer school. And then uh, if you get selected, we will pay to uh, for you to attend the summer school. There are uh, mailing lists about jobs and magnetism, postings, newsletters, there are a number of important society journals such as um, IEEE Magnetics Letters and the IEEE sections on magnetics. There's also an interesting outreach video. So if you want to convince your colleagues that magnetism is exciting, have a look at this video. And finally, we also organized the Distinguished Lecturer Series. And for 2020 and 21, there were four people chosen, Masashi Shiraishi, Tim Mewes, Bert Kopmans, and myself. And I'd just like to also advertise to stay in touch with the community that in addition to this excellent WTU2S uh, uh, series that uh, Shubankar is, ho is hosting, there are two other seminar series as well, more focused on Europe. This is a so-called SPICE seminar series, always Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Europe. And then there is a so-called spin talk series from the people um, uh, from Denver and Nebraska Lincoln. And um, this is, uh, you know, geared towards the American market. But, you know, I listen to all of these and, you know, I think it's super exciting to stay in touch is the best that we can do at the moment. So now let's start with the science. So uh, why have we started to work on antiferromagnets? Now, if you believe this guy here, which maybe some of you recognize is Louis Niel, and he said in the 1970 uh, Nobel lecture that antiferromagnets are interesting but useless. And yes, I think we all agree they're interesting. And today I'd like to show you whether they are really, really useless. And um, so why could they potentially be useful? Well, if you compare ferromagnets, which have a magnetic moment, and antiferromagnets, which in the simplest case, you have two sublattices which will fully compensate, they do not have a net magnetic moment. So in a ferromagnet, if you have a bit such as this one here or this one here, and it has neighboring bits, then they will talk to each other by stray field. They will dipolar coupling between these bits. And that means the stability of this bit here is different from this bit here because this bit is surrounded by bits that have the magnetization in the same direction and this bit here has actually dipolar interactions with bits that have opposite magnetization and this means this bit here will be less stable than this bit and that's bad. And um, also you can see that we store the information for ferromagnets in a 180 degree different direction of the magnetization. So magnetization to the right is a one, magnetization to the left is a zero. Now, both of this is different in antiferromagnets. In antiferromagnets, because we have no stray field, we can actually pack the bits very close to each other because there's no interaction. And therefore, potentially, we have 100 times more packing density. But also, actually, we cannot store the information in a 180 degree different orientation because we have these two sublattices. But whether one is right and the other one is left, or this one is left and that one is right, usually cannot be distinguished. And therefore, we have to store the information in 90 degree different orientation of the magnetization sublattices. And the direction of these magnetization sublattices is called the nail order or the nail vector. So here the nail vector is horizontal, and here the nail vector is a vertical. So let's then see uh, what makes ferromagnets and antiferromagnets different. So one key difference is that ferromagnets are susceptible to external fields because they have a net moment. So the susceptibility is typically like 10 to the 3. Now antiferromagnets that do not have a net moment have a very small susceptibility, like five orders of magnitude smaller. And why is that? Well, that is because the strongest energy scale for antiferromagnets is the intra-sublattice um, uh, inter exchange interaction, which couples the two spins into two sublattices antiferromagnetically, and that's of the order of a thousand Tesla and sets the transverse susceptibility. 
Now, the next strongest interaction is the intra sublattice coupling that couples two spins of the same sublattice parallel, and that is of the order of 100 Tesla, and together with this sets the nail temperature. And the important thing is that these are so high that we are not able to break apart this in most of the magnetic systems. However, there's one more energy scale, and that is the anisotropy that allows you to switch the antiferromagnetic order from this to that direction. And that can be of the order of a few Tesla. So that is something that is accessible in the lab, the so-called spin flop that I will explain later. But for you, the take home message is we will never be able by applying a field to align the sub lattices that are anti-parallel coupled parallel. Now, one of the consequences of this very strong antiparallel coupling of the two sub lattices is that the eigenfrequencies of the antiferromagnet are so called exchange enhanced to the terahertz range. In ferromagnets, typical eigenfrequencies are gigahertz. In antiferromagnets, they are like three orders of magnitude higher. And this is important because the eigenfrequencies ultimately limit the switching speed. So this means fundamentally we should be able to switch uh, antiferromagnets a thousand times faster than ferromagnets. And, and something that also many people are not aware of is that there are many more antiferromagnets than there are ferromagnets. Now why is that? Well, let me show you some examples of antiferromagnetic coupling. So here you see that in such a system, we can have one layer where the spins are pointing up, the next layer the spins are pointing up and then up again. And this is so-called layered antiferromagnet. But you can also within a, a layer have spins up and spins down, which then propagate through all the layers. Or you can have within a layer spins up and spin down and that reverses them when you go to the next layer. So these are all uh, different types of coupling that actually exist in reality. So here's an example of nickel oxide, where you see that within one layer, the spins are all pointing to the left, and within the next layer, they're all pointing to the right. And what is important though here is that the two layers cannot be, cannot be distinguished. Then there's manganese to gold, which is a metallic antiferromagnet, where again, in one layer, the spins are all pointing down, and the next one, they're all pointing up. And this we'll talk about in more detail later. And now these are all collinear antiferromagnets, meaning that I just have two sub lattices, the red and the blue spins, and they're always anti-parallel. But it can be even more complex in so-called non-collinear antiferromagnets, where you see here the spins are pointing in all kinds of directions, but within one plaquette, the total net magnetic moment is zero. And then you can go to non-collinear, non-coplanar antiferromagnets, where the spins are also pointing out of the plane. And you see there are many spins pointing in many directions, but the total magnetic moment, if you sum up all the moments in one plaquette, is still zero. And now this means you have many, many different exchange couplings between different spins. And they have a lot of opportunity for different types of materials to, in the end, have antiferromagnetic coupling. Um, another consequence that not so many people are aware of is that the oxidic nature of antiferromagnets very often leads to very strong magnetoelastic coupling, whereas in metallic uh, ferromagnets, this coupling tends to be weaker, meaning that with some strain, we can very efficiently orient the nail vector. And yeah, one of the consequences of these antiferromagnetic coupling is can that you also have very complex exchange interactions, exchange integrals between the different spins pointing in all kinds of directions. Whereas for ferromagnets, typically we have rather simple Heisenberg exchange. And now the question is useful. Well, obviously ferromagnets are useful. They're used in memory and sensing. And antiferromagnets are currently used as passive elements in exchange biasing spin valves. But they are not used as active elements because they're hard to measure and hard to control. And so what I want to tell you today is that antiferromagnets are definitely interesting and possibly even useful as active elements. And I'll show you the physics that we need to make them useful. So if there is one slide that you want to take home from this talk and afterwards have a coffee, here's a slide to remember. Ferromagnets are 19th century physics where you manipulate them, for instance, using Ersted fields. Antiferromagnets can be manipulated by, for instance, staggered spin orbitox, which is really 21st century physics. So here, the take home message is antiferromagnets, fancy science, possibly useful applications, super exciting, and ferromagnets, yeah, they kind of work. <laughs> okay, 
So this is the introduction. So I hope I've convinced you that we should really look into making antiferromagnetics useful. So here we go. So first thing is we need to read out the antiferromagnetic state of the system. So we need to read out the direction of the nail vector. So let's do that. Well, the most um, uh, obvious approach to do that, that is quite direct, is to use X-ray magnetic linear dichroism, uh, which essentially is the difference in the absorption of X-rays with a certain polarization, linear polarization, at a certain energy. And this absorption will be different if the polarization of our X-rays and the nail vector is parallel, sorry, parallel or perpendicular. So if you look at the black and the red curve, they actually don't fully overlap. There's a difference. And if you plot this difference, you can see here that indeed there is a difference that indicates if the polarization of our X-rays and the nail vector is parallel or perpendicular. And we can do this spatially resolved, and then we can actually see this domain structure where gray means that the nail vector is pointing right left in the horizontal direction, and black means the nail vector is pointing in the vertical direction. And we can do this as a function of temperature and then see that the contrast goes down and above the nail temperature, the contrast vanishes. This is some residual topographic contrast. Now I'd like just like to point out that this has been known for a long time. So there's some pioneering work from Andreas Scholl and the people at, um, uh, at the ALS. Um, and we did some work more recently here. And if you're interested to learn more about the absolute directions in 3D of these nail vectors, have a look at this paper, which is coming out in physical review applied. Now, this is great. It works. We can directly image the nail order. However, if you talk to the Intels or Samsungs of the world, they are not interested to put a synchrotron into their memory device. So we need all electrical readout. And this can be done as well. So here is an example of reading an insulating antiferromagnet using so-called spin-hole magnetoresistance. Now, spin hole magnetic resistance is an effect where we put on top of our antiferromagnet a platinum wire. We flow current in the platinum wire, and by the spin hole effect, this generates a spin accumulation of right and left spins at the interfaces. And now, this spin accumulation can actually diffuse into the antiferromagnet if the antiferromagnet has a component of the nail vector that is perpendicular to the spin. If the nail vector of the antiferromagnet is fully parallel to the spin, then the spin current cannot enter and it's reflected. And when it goes back into the platinum, it generates by the inverse spin hall effect a voltage and therefore it changes the resistance, resistance of the platinum wire. And so when we measure the longitudinal resistance of the platinum wire, we expect that we get a contribution that is proportional to the square of the dot product between the direction of the nail vector and the spins in the spin accumulation. And this effect was first found in this paper here by Nakayama et al. and recently discussed also for antiferromagnets by Aurélien Monchamp. Now this has then been measured in nickel oxide where we rotate the nail order in different planes, either in the plane or perpendicular to the plane of the current. And then we measure the longitudinal resistance of the platinum. And this was first done in the group of Bart van Bees in this paper, and then later by us and also the group of Sebastian Gönnwein. And we see very nicely that as we rotate our nail vector, we get this sine squared dependence or cosine squared dependence um, that you can see here, which indicates that the direction of the nail vector changes the resistance of our platinum wire. So this is the longitudinal resistance. And if you're interested, there's more information in these two papers. So that is great. So this can be done in order to read out antiferromagnetic insulators. How about antiferromagnetic metals? So here's an example, so-called manganese to gold. So this is also a collinear antiferromagnet. And again, we can do XMLD-based imaging, where we see that this time gray means that the nail vector is in the vertical direction, and black means the nail vector is in the horizontal direction. And we can also make this as grown. You have the same number of gray and black domains, but you can also make this more gray by applying a strong field, which I'll explain later. But you can fundamentally make this rather monodomain to have mostly domain, uh, the nail vector point just in the up and down direction. So now we want to measure the resistance. This is a metallic antiferromagnet, so we don't put anything on top. We just measure the resistance of the manganese to gold. 
And then we see that there is actually a sizable difference in the resistance for the current flowing parallel to the nail vector and the current flowing perpendicular to the nail vector of 0.15%. <clears throat> so this is an anisotropic magnetoresistance that depends on the direction of our current with respect to the nail vector. So if the nail vector is parallel, then we have a lower resistance. If it is perpendicular, we have a higher resistance. So this works. However, then we now applied a strong field and see how the resistance of the system changes. And we can actually apply up to 60 Tesla at the high field lab in Dresden. And then we see that when we apply a strong field, initially the resistance just goes up in a more quadratic way, which is ordinary magneto resistance and not related to any change of the antiferromagnetic nail vector. But then at about you know, 30 to 50 Tesla, you see there is an irreversible change of the resistance. And this is then due to the rotation of the nail vector. And that looks all good, but when we then go back to zero, we have actually a sizable change of the resistance of 0.75%. But before we set the AMRs only 0.15%. So the question is, where does this difference come from? And so then, we looked at the uh, resistance as a function of time, and we see that this 0.75% change over the course of a few seconds actually goes back to this 0.15%. And our interpretation, and we're very happy to also get some insights from smart theoreticians, our uh, interpretation is that the 0.75% is including domain wall magneto resistance, because when you apply the strong field, you get rid of all the domain walls, and then they come back later when and we have um, uh, nucleated, thermally nucleated domain walls due to local variations in the strain. If you're interested, there is a recent paper with more of the details. But the good news is we can read out the magnetization, so the antiferromagnetic order parameter electrically. Now, something very exciting and which is unpublished, so I'm going to be quite brief on this, is you can also do this on 2D antiferromagnets. And I think this is really exciting material. So we've worked on the trihalides like chromium chloride, which is a layered antiferromagnet, meaning if you have a monolayer, it's a ferromagnet. If you have a bilayer, it's a fully compensated antiferromagnet. If you have a trilayer, it's a partly compensated antiferromagnet. So this is really amazing. You have huge tunability by varying the number of layers. And we looked at chromium thiophosphate, which was a layered um, a 2D antiferromagnet, and then we also see these resistance changes. So now to sum this up, so the electrical readout works. We can do this in insulators by the spin hole magnetic resistance, and in metals by anisotropic magnetic resistance and domain wall magnetic resistance. We can do direct imaging using X-ray magnetic linear dichroism combined with X-ray microscopy. And then there are a lot of other mechanisms that I did not have time to go into. So I'm very happy to send you the slides. So you don't need to write down all the references. Send me an email and uh, the email address is at the end of this talk. And then I'll send you the slides and you can look up all these references. So there's some exciting work on thermal Seebeck imaging, for instance, from Cornell. Anomalous Nance effect, imaging uncompensated moments, second harmonic generation, magnetic optical curve effect, exchange bias, and many more. Okay, so now we can read out the antiferromagnetic state. Next step is we need to write it. How do we write the nail order? Now, as I said, in antiferromagnets, the susceptibility is small, which means that if you apply a field, the canting of these two sub lattices tends to be very small. So this is exaggerated, the size of this. So you see that there's only very small canting, only very small magnetic moment. However, this is still sufficient to switch the direction of the nail order by an applied field because the small induced magnetic moment by the canting would like to lie parallel to the applied field so that when you apply a field along this direction, the nail order will be in the perpendicular direction. If you apply a field this direction, again, the nail order will be in the perpendicular direction so that the small candid moment is parallel to the applied field. And this so-called spin flop. And essentially it's governed by a square root of the anisotropy and the exchange field. Now for the spin flip, which I'm only going to very briefly introduce, you actually have a parallel alignment of the two sub lattices and that only happens for very strong anisotropies and very low exchange interaction. So that's just for sake of completeness. We are not going to consider this. So let's look, go to the spin flop. 
So here, what we did is we actually applied a strong field to orient the magnetization, so the sublattice, the nail order. And we then measure the X-ray magnetic linear dichroism signal. And we see if we apply field along this direction, we get this XMLD signal where we first see a dip and then a peak. And if we then switch the field by 90 degrees, then we first get first a peak and then a dip. So clearly by applying the field, we can orient the nail order due to the spin flop. Now, of course, these are very strong fields that we apply. And so, you know, we cannot put a 60 Tesla magnet into our uh, memory device. So I told you already that um, these antiferromagnets can have very strong magnetoelastic coupling. And this means if we can apply a little bit of strain, this might change the direction of the nail order. So here we have a medieval torture device where you put the sample on top of the central bar and then we tighten the screws until either the sample confesses or dies. So we apply mechanical strain and when we do that, we see for the unstrained sample there is little signal because we have domains in all kinds of directions. But if we apply a strain of just 0.1%, we get, we get a clear signal of first a peak and then a dip, showing that we have aligned the direction of the nail vector by this strain. So this is really good and relatively small strain allows you to orient the direction of the nail vector. However, again, if you talk to Intel or Samsung, they are not interested to put a medieval torture device into their memory. So we need something which is all electrical. You want all electrical switching. So here's an example of typical all electrical switching done in ferromagnets. This can be done using spin transfer or spin orbit torques. So here in spin transfer torque, you inject a spin polarized current with a spin of the electrons in a certain direction. And this electron then transfers its spin angular momentum to the magnetization and thereby rotates its own spin direction. And the magnetization due to conservation of angular momentum rotates in the opposite direction. So in this case, all the magnetization would try to rotate clockwise. So this works very well in ferromagnets and it's part of spin torque MRAM, which actually is in the market. However, now for antiferromagnet, if the spin of the electron enters here, it would actually act on one sublattice to rotate it clockwise and on the next sublattice to rotate it counterclockwise, but they are strongly antiferromagnetically coupled, so this should not work. However, it turns out that actually there are predictions that, and actually experiments that I will show you, that there is electrical switching of antiferromagnets. And why is that? So, um, the reason is that there are antiferromagnets where the torques acting on the two sublattices are different. As I said, if they are the same, then you know nothing should happen. But if they are opposite, then it should switch. And this can happen if the two sublattices are inequivalent. And this you can see very nicely in this picture here from manganese to gold. If you look at the manganese B sublattice, then you see the four manganese B sublattices. If they look up, they see a manganese A. And if they look down, they see a gold atom. The four manganese A sublattices, if they look up, they see a gold atom. And if they look down, they see a manganese B sublattice atom. So these four sublattices A and B are inequivalent, meaning that fundamentally there can be opposite torques allowed for the two sublattices. And the same is also the case for copper manganese arsenide. And there's a nice uh, drawing of um, how this you can imagine this so that you actually have a coil wound around the A, A side sublattice and the B side sublattice in different orientations. So here you have a clockwise coil, here you have a counterclockwise coil, and that means if you now apply the current, then the two sublattices will actually find torques in opposite directions so that they coherently rotate by 90 degrees. And this was first predicted in this paper, Jakob, Jakob Seleszny, Iris Inova, Thomas Jungwirth, and then first found experimentally in the, uh, by Pete Wadley from Nottingham together with the Prague people, and then later also by us, in particular Martin Jordan in Manganese to Gold, and also uh, Markus Meinert in this paper here. So the prediction is that if you apply a current, the nail vectors would switch in a direction that is perpendicular to the current.
And that means by applying a current along two 90 degree different directions, we end up with two 90 degree different directions of the nail vector. And this was measured in this paper by um, uh, Stas Bodna together with Thomas Jungwirth, Jairo Sinova, uh, Martin Jordan and myself. And we saw that when we inject current along this 110 direction, the planar Hall effect resistance goes up. And if we apply current along the 110 direction, it goes down reliably. If you increase the current density, even the amplitude goes up. So this means we can switch the direction of our nail vector by 90 degrees by applying current directions, uh, current pulses in 90 degree different directions. Now, this is great. As I said, has been shown for copper manganese arsenide and uh, manganese to gold. And the problem is that it only works for systems where the two sub lattices are inequivalent. And there are only very few materials such as manganese to gold, copper manganese arsenide, copper manganese antimony. So we would much rather like to have an electrical switching mechanism that also works for systems where the sub lattices cannot be distinguished. And this was put first forward in this group uh, by Kyung Jin Lee in this paper by Shino et al. and also by Han Gomola and Hiro Sinova in this paper, where they predicted that if you have a domain wall in an antiferromagnet, so for instance, insulating nickel oxide, you put platinum on top, and then due to the spin hall effect, this generates a spin accumulation at the interface with nickel oxide and then exerts a torque on the domain wall to move the domain wall. And the exciting thing about this mechanism is that domain wall motion antiferromagnets can be very, very fast as shown in these two papers here. So in ferromagnets, you have the Walker breakdown, which limits your speed to a few hundred meters per second. In antiferromagnets, you can get to orders of magnitude faster domain wall motion and thus much faster switching speed of one to two orders of magnitude higher switching speeds as shown here. It actually was also observed experimentally that you can get to thousands of meters per second. Now, the problem, however, with this mechanism is that the domain wall motion direction depends now on the chirality of the domain wall. So if our domain wall switches like this, or if it goes like this, and that means if you don't have a symmetry breaking, so no Lifshitz invariance, then half of the domain walls will move one way, half of the domain walls will move the other way. And so in the end, there is no net switching, but we do need a net switching mechanism. And so this was suggested by Helen Gomonai in this paper here, that you can have a ponderomotive force where for 90 degree domain walls, the spin accumulation from the spin hall effect exerts a torque as to switch the nail vector in a direction perpendicular to the spin accumulation so that you have a net switching of the magnetic moment. So this is all theory and we were an experimentalist, we're experimentalists, so we'd like to find out if this actually exists in reality. So for that, we fabricated nickel oxide platinum wires where we have here four contacts and we inject current pulses along two 90 degree different directions as shown here. And then we measure the resistance and we see if we can switch the nail order. And the first thing is, yes, something happens, but it looks rather complex. So let me walk you through this. So first, we actually see that at low current density, nothing happens. Then we increase the current density and we see that for one direction of the current, we have a switching and increase in the resistance. And then we change the current direction. It decreases and then it goes up again and so on. And so the current direction simply changes the magnetic electrical signal that the electrical signal that we measure. So that looks good. But then if we increase the current density further, something really weird happens. So first we see there's an increase of the resistance and then a decrease, and then again, increase and decrease. And that means that the same current direction can change the resistance in two ways. And that is really weird. It means spin talks with the same current direction should always act in the same direction. So this cannot be. So we set out to understand this. Um, we set out to understand this by trying to find, find out what part of the electrical signal actually corresponds to magnetic switching. And then what is the origin of the non-magnetic signal and what is the origin of the magnetic signal? We are not the only ones to do that. So there's some really nice work here in these papers as well. So what part of the electrical signal corresponds to magnetic switching? So therefore we would like to do direct imaging. I really like direct imaging. Imaging shows you what is happening. 
So here's a magnetic image of a cross. We inject a single current pulse and bang, the Niel order switches by 90 degrees. Then we inject a current pulse with a perpendicular direction and the Niel order switches again. So it's shown in this paper here, we can really directly observe how the Niel order due to the current injection changes. Now, what is now of this magnetic switching is actually reflected in the electrical signal. So now we compare the imaged switched area with the size of the electrical signal. And then we see that initially they show the same behavior, but then the image switched area saturate, saturates, but the electrical signal continues to increase. And same initially when we reverse the current direction, the switched area changes again, but then saturates, but the electrical signal continues to change. So it looks like there's part of the signal that reflects the magnetic signal, but also there's part of the electrical signal that is not reflecting a change of the magnetic spin configuration. And so to understand this better, we uh, rescale the signal where we see that, okay, initially when we have a switching of the magnetization by obtained by imaging and we rescale the electrical signal to correspond to that, then as the signal continues to increase electrically, the switched area from the imaging saturates, so there is a difference, and we subtract this difference by a linear fit, and then we get good agreement. And now the question is, is this a robust method to extract the switched area that we obtain from imaging from the electrical measurements? And to do that, we did many, many experiments using many different current densities where we see if you have more current density, then more switching occurs and more area of the magnetization is changed. We do this for many, many current densities where we see at low current densities, there is no switching. And then as we increase the current density, then this black area starts to go towards the um, uh, unswitched center of the structure until even the center of the structure has switched. And then for very very high current densities, the full area has switched. And we compare the amount of the area that has switched as obtained from imaging with the height of the electrical signal. And then what is nice, we actually see a perfect correlation. So this means this is a robust method to obtain the amount of area that has switched from the electrical signal. Now the question is, however, this non-magnetic signal, where does that come from? And to identify this, we did switching of cobalt oxide, and you can see the results in this paper here. And what we did is cobalt oxide has a nail temperature, which is around room temperature. And that's great because it means that we can very easily go above and below the nail temperature. If we go below the nail temperature, we have this rectangular switching. And then we have this triangular switching, which you know, has some non-magnetic component. And if we go above the nail temperature, we only have this triangular switching. So there's no magnetic ordering here. So everything that we see here in the green curve must be non-magnetic. And actually, there have been very nice works to understand the origin of this non-magnetic signal, for instance, here by Matala et al, and also by Churikova, and here in this paper by Chang and Jaco. And they find that there's really electromigration effects happening that lead to a change of the resistance that has no magnetic meaning. Okay, so now we know how to distinguish between magnetic and non-magnetic signals, but we still want to know what is the origin of the magnetic signal. So to check this, we started with current flowing either in the horizontal direction or current flowing around these two corners so that at the center of our cross, we still have the current in the same direction for both cases. Just the current flow profile, profile is a bit different. And then we see surprisingly that there is different switching. So at the center where the current is identical, we see different switching, and that is very surprising. It means it cannot be dominated by spin orbitorks. So to check if it really is not spin orbitorks, we remove the platinum in a ring, meaning that here in the center, there's no current flowing, just there is nickel oxide. So there's no current flowing in the center. So the current is flowing around and we now compare the switching in the center with no current flowing and the switching around with current flowing. And we see that both the center and the area around switch. 
And if you reverse the current direction and change by 90 degrees, also both the center and the area around don't switch, uh, switch. And so this means it cannot be spin orbit torques, but it's a thermomagnetoelastic switching mechanism, which is also very interesting because it allows for non-contact writing. We can write in areas where there's no current flowing. And if you're interested, the details on this paper here, and this actually was also observed in this paper here for another material. So the conclusion is that really there is magnetic switching during the current pulses. The transport data, the electrical data can detect magnetic switching, but also the additional electromigration effect signals and the origin of the magnetic switching in our case is dominated by thermomagnetoelastic switching due to thermal expansion. There can also be spin orbit torques, but I don't have time to go into that. So to sum up the writing, we can write by magnetic fields, we can write by strain, but in particular, we can write by currents using these bulk nail staggered spin orbitox in special metallic antiferromagnets that have these distinguishable sublattices, such as manganese to gold and copper manganese arsenide. And we can switch by interfacial non staggered spin orbitox, for instance, in insulating antiferromagnetic platinum bilayers. There's a thermoing to elastic switching process that happens, also additional electromigration effects, and there's thermal gradients due to the entropy as well as quench switching. And if you're interested, ask me for the slides and I can give you all the references. And now you tell me, well, you have demonstrated reading and writing, why don't you make a memory device? And actually we did, not us, but our colleagues in Prague, they made a magnetic memory based on copper manganese arsenide. They put this here in a chip carrier into an Arduino chip that you can plug by USB into your computer and you have a one bit magnetic memory. Your density is not impressive, but it works up to 12 Tesla and down to 250 picoseconds limited by the pulse length. And I don't know of any other magnetic memory that works at 12 Tesla. And now the last uh, five minutes, I'm going to uh, use to explain to you a little bit about long distance spin transport and antiferromagnets. Now we can write and read the, magnetic di the magnetization direction, so the subletters, the nail vector. How about transporting spin? Now, here is an example of how we want to transport spin. So we have an antiferromagnetic insulator. And here we have an injector, a spin injector, which can be a platinum wire, where due to the spin hall effect, you generate a spin accumulation at the interface with this antiferromagnetic insulator. And then the spin accumulation injects a spin current, which then travels in the antiferromagnetic insulator. And then it is absorbed by a second detector of platinum wire where the generated spin current in the platinum wire by the inverse spin hall effect generates a longitudinal charge current, so a voltage that can be measured. This was first pioneered by the good group of Bart van Wees for ferromagnetic or ferrimagnetic insulators such as YIG. We also did some work on that and then extended to antiferromagnets. And so the antiferromagnet that we use here is hematite. Hematite is alpha Fe203. It's a very nice antiferromagnet, which is collinear, as seen here, with two subplatices, blue and red. And it has an easy 111 axis, so so called C plane, meaning that the uh, 111 axis here is out of the plane. And um, we can look at different surfaces, such as C plane, where the easy axis is perpendicular to the plane, and also R plane, where the easy axis is roughly in the plane or makes some smaller angle with the plane of the surface. So the details of the anisotropies and so on have been, have been obtained in this paper here. And now what we do is we measure the signal as a function of the distance between the injector and the detector wire. And the surprising finding was that we actually observe transport over tens of micrometer length scale. So this is the longest recorded transport of spin information uh, in any antiferromagnet and also is comparable to what has found in the best ferromagnets. So we see here that there is long transport over tens of micrometers. And also we see that actually there is no threshold for the current density and we can measure at rather elevated temperatures and we see there's an exponential decay for large distances. And this tells us the type of transport is diffusive. There have been predictions about superfluid transport and we have not seen signatures of superfluid transport, but even for diffusive transport, we see transport over 80 micrometers, which is great. So we then compared the different surfaces, C-plane and R-plane hematite, uh, 
And even though it's the same material with just different surfaces, we see that the spin transport length scales are actually not identical. And so that's kind of surprising. The same material has different spin transport length scales depending on which um, surface you are looking at. And so we found that there are variations of factors 10 in the transport length scale. And even we see that for this um, uh, C-plane, we actually cannot uh, fit our data with a single exponential decay. So there's something going on beyond simple diffusion. So to check out why there are so different transport length scales, we did imaging of the domain structure. And so here we see that for systems where we see a very short transport length scale, we also see small domains and many domain walls. For systems with a 600 nanometer transport length scale, our domain size is also of the order of 500 nanometer. And for systems where we see very long transport length scales of microns, we see very large domain sizes. And for instance, nickel oxide, we have very small domains and very short spin transport length scale. So it looks like the domain structure governs the spin transport. And to understand this, we went to our theory colleagues at the NTNU, here the paper by Tweten et al, and they predicted that magnons, the spin, polar, the, the spin currents, magnonic spin currents are scattered at the um, domain walls. And therefore, the more domain walls you have, the more scattering you get, and therefore the less transport is possible and the shorter the spin transport length scale is. So you get some kind of magnon domain wall resistance. And this means we can actually have a spin transport length scale that is governed by the number of domain walls and the size of the domains. Okay, and now finally, um, since, um, it was predicted that you can only have spin transport in the easy access phase of hematite, and hematite undergoes a phase transition to an easy plane phase, usually below room temperature. Uh, we looked at some doping of the hematite to increase the so-called Morin phase transition to above room temperature, which is working here, so we can actually have easy access spin transport at room temperature. However, it turns out <clears throat> that this is not even necessary. You can actually transport spin even in the easy plane phase, which is quite exciting because you mix linearly polarized magnets to obtain, obtain circularly polarized magnets. And this was found in this two paper by our colleagues at MIT and ourselves, and recently also studied in more complex anisotropies here in this work by our Munich colleagues and ourselves as well. So transport is possible in easy access and easy plane and also combined anisotropies and it's possible at low temperature and room temperature so it's a very uh, hematite is a very versatile platform to obtain transport of spin over long distances and now finally one teaser slide on skirmions yes in hematite we even have skirmions so this is an anti-ferromagnetic anti-skirmion if you're interested there is uh, more details in this paper here and there's also a nice work by some colleagues also looking at these systems in hematite with imaging Okay, so that brings me to the um, summary of the transport. So we have looked at diffusive versus superfluid spin transport and found diffusive transport and insulating antiferromagnets over very long length scales. There's a strong influence of the domains and domain walls on the spin transport. And there are a lot of other transport studies by our colleagues, vertical transport across antiferromagnets and magnon spin walls. Again, I'm happy to share the slides and you can have a look at all the references. Now, the most important slide, this is a group picture of all the people that did all the work because I usually just uh, travel around the world and give talks. So these days I sit in my office and give talks. And this is what we usually look like, but this is what we look like at the moment and hopefully for not much longer. So then we can again travel and see you all in person. And I just like to point out that a lot of this work was driven by two excellent postdocs, Lorenzo Baldrati and Romain Lebrun, who've both now go on uh, to uh, get permanent positions. And um, uh, Gerhard Jakob, who's been driving in my group as a senior staff scientist, love the oxide work, Martin Jordan, who started and drove all the manganese to gold work, and Hartmut Zabel, our senior uh, professor, who's been instrumental in helping us about scattering methods. And so I also acknowledge collaborations because we had great work with theory colleagues in Mainz and at Synchrotrons, with theory colleagues at the, my co-affiliation in Norway, 
and in Utrecht and uh, with people at uh, Toko University and many of them have now moved to uh, Leeds, Joe Barker, Oleg has now moved to Sydney, Rafael Ramas to Spain and Eiji to Tokyo, Garrett is still in Tohoku, um, also with people at the MPI in Stuttgart, Uli Novak in Constance for simulations and I got support for slides from Vincent Balz from Grenoble and Takamori Yamato from Kyoto and also I uh, have good interactions with our up and issue people, colleagues and friends in Jülich. And nothing would work without the funding. In particular, I acknowledge the IEEE Magnetic Society, as well as a number of uh, EU projects, including ASPIN and um, S Nebula, um, and also the ERC 3D Magic Grant and the SpinNet project, and of course the QSPIN funding in Norway. And so to sum it up, I've shown you that we can read antiferromagnets by XMLD, X-ray magnetic linear dichroism and curve microscopy, and in insulators by electrically by spin hole magnetic resistance, and in metals by AMR. These are the papers if you're interested. We can write antiferromagnetic insulators and metals by current injection due to spin orbit torques and strain. Again, here are the papers. And we can transport spin over long distances in antiferromagnetic insulators, and we can tune the spin transport by the domain structure. Again, here are the papers. If you are new to the field, I just recommend these very good introductory reviews uh, here in Review of Modern Physics and the whole range of papers in Nature Physics, um, which you can read as an introduction to the field. And with that, I uh, thank you for your attention and I hope to see you next year in person in India. Here's my email address if you're interested for in the slides or if you have any questions. If you want to join us, we also have visiting uh, uh, positions for students and open PhD positions. Yeah, thank you a lot, uh, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Matthias, for this very, very excellent uh, lecture, uh, summarizing many interesting sub areas. So I clap for your excellent lecture. <laughs> thank you so much. You know, it, if it would have been a real in-person lecture, then uh, there would be hundreds of clappings and uh, <laughs> on, on behalf of everyone. So there are uh, some questions, uh, one from one of my students. Uh, Isita Pandey. Isita, would you like to ask or should I read your question? Okay. Well, I ask, why magnetoelastic coupling is high for antiferromagnets in comparison to the ferromagnets? Yes, so this is a very, very good question. So, um, it is high usually in oxides because in oxides where you have super exchange, the exchange is governed by the positions of the magnetic atom like manganese, the oxygen and the manganese. And if you have a little bit of strain and the position and the overlap of the orbitals between the manganese, the oxygen and the other manganese change, then this changes the exchange interaction and therefore generates a strong anisotropy. So it is not per se um, always high for antiferromagnets, but it tends to be high for oxides, and many antiferromagnets are oxides. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I hope this, this helped. <laughs> I, have, uh, I have a very small question. Um, I don't know if it is accurate or not. Um, in next, let's say, five years, Matthias, uh, what should we look at? I mean, insulating antiferromagnets, uh, we should explore more metallic antiferromagnets. Well, I think both is exciting. It really depends what you want to look at. I think if you want to look at spin transport, insulating antiferromagnets are more exciting because simply they tend to have lower damping because there are no electrons to, to, to dissipate the angular momentum to. Um, and so the spin transport length scales in insulating antiferromagnets intrinsically are longer than um, in, in metallic antiferromagnets. Um, for switching, I think, of course, these uh, systems with broken inversion symmetry, such as manganese to gold, copper manganese arsenide, are very exciting to probe things like this ultra fast switching uh, due to spin orbit torques. Um, but also, of course, magnetic resistance effects are interesting in these um, metallic antiferromagnets. Um, I think what is also super exciting and which we are working on, but I didn't have time to go into, are non-collinear antiferromagnets. They're much more difficult to read out because all these uh, methods such as XMLD don't work. Um, so I think there's a lot of interest and I think there are key things you need to demonstrate, fast, low power switching, readout with high magnetic resistance effects, transport over long length scales. I think there are key demonstrations that are necessary to demonstrate that antiferromings can be useful. But yeah, I think all is exciting. It depends really on what you find most exciting. Okay, I think there is some issue. I cannot copy paste uh, 
I'm copy pasting some wrong message. Uh, Sawata so Malik has uh, put my question to, but he has put unfortunately directly to me. I was trying to put to everyone, but there is some issue in copy pasting. Anyway, I read it. Uh, he says, thank you very much for such an informative and comprehensive presentation. Can you please give your point of view if the same can be achieved using synthetic antiferromagnets? In principle, yes. the yeah. Yeah. is usually less in the SAP in comparison to the antiferromagnets making them accessible in lower fields? Yes. Yeah, that's a very good question. So synthetic antiferromagnets, I think, are also a fascinating topic. And actually, one of these papers here is on synthetic antiferromagnets. Um, so um, I think synthetic antiferromagnets are a great bridge from ferromagnets to antiferromagnets. The reason is that they're much easier to read out because you can focus, for instance, on one of the layers. But due to the antiferromagnet RKKY interaction, there is actually also an enhancement of the spin dynamics. However, the frequency of the spin dynamics is enhanced. And then maybe I can just go to the slide. Um, sorry, let me just go here to the, uh, to the slide that shows you the speed. It's enhanced by this um, square root of the exchange here times the, uh, um, uh, sorry, no, that's not the frequency. Uh, yeah, here, so, so here this is the enhancement is, is um, um, it goes via the factor that is the exchange interaction. And the problem is if your exchange interaction is not very strong and in synthetic antiferromagnets, typically it's like a few kilohertz that switching field, then also the eigenfrequencies will not be so high. So if you really want to make use of these ultra fast frequencies, you need to go to intrinsic antiferromagnets that have this super strong antiferromagnetic coupling. But I think it's a super exciting topic. We're working on it. And um, yeah, I think it makes life quite a lot easier to start with synthetic antiferromagnets. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rana, Another question on the MOOC imaging? Yeah. So maybe like yeah. Ah. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello, Matthias. Uh, nice to hear you again. Uh, uh, I was wondering about this uh, MOOC imaging of uh, nickel oxide. Mm -hmm. uh, is it the standard uh, MOOC or is it something different? Uh, uh, some I looked into the paper, but I thought I would just directly ask. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, it, so firstly, the Kerr microscope is a very standard, you know, without doing advertising, Evico, Magnetics, uh, Rudy Schäfer's design, um, uh, Kerr microscope. The method to measure this is a little bit non-conventional by doing two different directions of the polarization analysis to a subtraction. It is described in this paper. And also there isn't, we are not the first to do this. There was a paper before that showed that you can have a nickel oxide, um, the uh, Mo contrast. Um, if you want to have details, send me an email as a master thesis by one of my students who just graduated, Felix Schreiber, actually an excellent master student. So I can mm -hmm. encourage uh, you uh, to look at the, his thesis where this is described in a lot of detail. I think that's the best thing I can give you because there you have all the details. I can explain it to you now, but I think it's even better if you just read the thesis. So fire me an email and I will uh, try and uh, send you a copy of the thesis. Okay. okay. All right. So maybe right. I'll just... Thank you. Thank you, Pranab. Uh, actually, I was also having a similar question. So thanks for asking. So uh, is there any other questions from anyone else? I do not see. Uh, I just, uh, if I can ask one more question, uh, uh, this Fe two O three, the spin transport that you use, these are epitaxial films or polycrystalline uh, films. Uh, so, so they are all epitaxial films. Um, the problem with oxides is that usually they don't work well for polycrystalline uh, samples because um, the magnetic order is usually very sensitive to the crystalline order. And therefore you want to have epitaxial samples to have a good magnetic order. Um, so that we have looked at epitaxial samples. Um, there are reports of polycrystalline nickel oxide. And we also looked at that. That also works, but I would say it's less controlled. Um, and the domain structure is very different. So we get um, definitely not these very nice large domains that you see here for polycrystalline nickel oxide or hematite. Okay. Okay, so it's quite surprising to see such a large uh, spin, uh, I mean, transport length in iron oxide. Uh, well, 
Hmm. I think what the shows thickness it, yeah, is hundred micron. Is it is it a horizontal line, right? not vertical, right? Uh, Yes, it's, it's not a, a bulk crystal. 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 It's a bulk crystal. Oh, it's, it's a bulk crystal. crystal. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, so the large um, mm. domains and the large um, uh, spin transport landscapes that we observed, they are all from bulk crystals. The spin transport that we get in the epitextual films are usually an order of magnitude smaller. So here, the large domains, this is a bulk crystal, which we just bought commercially. Okay. Yeah, okay. And these are thin films. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. But even in thin films, we get these very nice large domains. And there, I think I should also point out that Rafael Ramos, the postdoc that has uh, implemented the growth, uh, I should a lot of credit has to go to him because he developed this process of, develop, of, of depositing this very high quality uh, 3D metal oxides that show these nice large domains, even for thin films. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those, uh, Matthias, uh, those domains in uh, nickel oxide just looks like 360 degree domain walls, isn't it? Um, no, usually it's 90 degree domain walls. So here, this is 90 degree domain wall. There's a 90 degree different yeah. orientation. Mm -hmm. Where do you ask? Sorry? Yeah, just, Ramos, uh, just put these slides back. Ah, sorry. The, yeah, in, in yes. So let me just show you the. So here. Um, in this, uh, so there it looks like you have, yeah, you have like 360 degree domain walls, but it's actually not so easy to interpret. There can also be anti phase boundaries, like here, you mean, yeah, yes. yeah, oh, sorry, but it can also be anti phase boundaries. Um, so that's actually something there in this paper, they looked at this in a bit more detail to look if it's chiral or non chiral. Um, so one has to be a little bit careful because, you know, in anti ferromagnets, in, in collinear anti ferromagnets, there can be this and this like an, 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 an anti-phase boundary that can also occur, which has the same contrast, even though it's not the same domain. Uh, so it's a, bit, it's, it's a bit tricky. It's a bit trickier in, in, this, in this material. So I think there was one more question from Mr. Malik. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, can you please explain why the Walker breakdown does not come into the picture for the antiferromagnets? If you can consider two sublattices, then we may have opposite precision of spins in both sublattices at high field or not. Yeah, so the Walker breakdown is, is not prevented, it's just pushed to very, very high excitations, just because you have this strong exchange coupling. So um, yeah, you can have Walker breakdown, but it's just at much, much higher uh, excitations and therefore you can get to much higher fields before the Walker breakdown sets in. Fundamentally, it still exists. It's just suppressed by this very strong antiferromagnetic coupling. Hi, Subhangar, can I ask one question? Yeah, please. please. Yeah. Hi, uh, Matthias, this is uh, Asis. So I'm also from uh, NICER. Uh, so very excellent talk, uh, very informative. And so I have one question regarding uh, this uh, uh, switching of antichromanet. So this is, uh, it explained with the Edelstein, Rasba Edelstein effect uh, with uh, the staggered um, uh, induced magnetization there. So that's mm -hmm. why you have a, switching in different way. So yeah, there yeah. also, you, uh, you know, there is a, some something if people call about the spin Rasba Edelstein effect and the orbital Rasba Edelstein effect. And mm -hmm. uh, some uh, cases it's that that orbital one is much, much stronger than spin one. So, and also it has a non relativistic origin. So do you get any signature of in your experiment or how one can probe this? Uh, can we just comment mm -hmm. on that, this orbital one? Yeah, I mean, okay, so uh, theoretically, these orbital currents are very exciting. And my colleague and uh, Yura Mokruzov here in Mainz, he is really into that. And if you send me an email, I can send you a recent PRL that we published last year with him, where we looked at the effect of orbital currents on switching. The problem is experimentally, what we do is we measure two torques. We measure damping like in a field like torque. That's all we can measure. And now the origin of these torques, whether it's the Rush by Edelstein, so inverse spin galvanic effect, some spin hall effect, some interfacial spin hall effect, this is all something that we can deduce kind of only indirectly by smart sample engineering. Um, and therefore, uh, it's not something that we can directly measure. Um, so what we have done, for instance, to check if there are effects of orbital currents is to look at um, a sample of a garnet, platinum, and copper-copper oxide. Uh, 
And then we generate a current and we find that there's enhancement if you put cop copper oxide on top of the platinum compared to pure platinum, showing that in the copper oxide you generate by orbital Hall effect an orbital current that is then converted in the platinum to a spin current that then acts on the garnet to switch it. Um, so this kind of indirect uh, evidence so that the there is a strong effect of orbital currents, but we cannot directly measure it. So in principle, that in order to act on the spin, so then you need the spin orbit coupling possibly that can yeah. go through that indirect path. That, yeah, that yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, yeah, orbital and spin are, you know, if there's no spin orbit coupling, they don't talk to each other. Okay. So and we have used platinum as um, as the, the converter to convert the orbital current into a spin current that then acts on the spin. Can I ask another question? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so one more question is that regarding this thing, is it possible that, that with this uh, current, can you switch the uh, jelzinski moria interactions, uh, uh, sign of the jelzinski moria interaction, for example, going from the right-handed to left-handed kind of thing so with this current? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, this we have shown, there's now two papers uh, from uh, Matsumitsu Hayashi and us, uh, two PRLs published two years ago, I think, or last year. Oh, no, I think two years ago now, um, where we demonstrate by injecting a current, you can switch the sign, the strength and the sign of the DMI. I think this is super exciting and we are continuing to work on this now. I think at the moment, no one has a very good explanation, but since both Masamitsu Hayashi's group and our group, we saw the same effect in separate samples, separate setups, separate people. I think it's robust, it exists. <laughs> Initially, I was very skeptical. I was like, yeah, you know, I'm sure the student has made a mistake or something. And the poor student had to remeasure it a lot of times until I was convinced, but he was correct. So it really changes science. So the, the, the chirality of our domain wall or skirmion changes with current injection. Um, yeah, I think uh, we try to explain it. We are not really sure um, if we can explain it or we're pretty sure we don't have the full explanation. So any smart theoretician, send me an email. I'll send you the experimental data. Please explain it because we're a little bit at a loss where it comes from, but it's a robust effect that has been seen in different labs on different samples. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I think it's uh, time. Uh, I have another meeting. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm seeing that a uh, lot of good discussions and Matthias is always open. He has written, if you want to get, your, get his slides, you can write him and discuss uh, more with him. So I think again, on behalf of all the audience, uh, we had a very large participation, nearly 70 people. And uh, I have to really thank Matthias again and again for your excellent talk and your real kind uh, efforts and time uh, to spend something uh, with us. I, look, I really look forward that you visit uh, India next year and NICER or this year, maybe if after getting your socks. Mm, yeah, yeah. So, uh, absolutely. I, yeah. mean, I will let you know, we, I still have money from my IEEE Distinguished Lecturer funds to, to spend this year. So I hope to be able to see you. And, and thanks to Banka for putting this together. I think this is a great service to the community. I think a lot of people really benefit from this to stay in touch with the latest developments. And I also really enjoy it just listening to the talk, sometimes just on YouTube, if I don't have time to be live there. It's, it really helps the community. It helps our field to advance. So thanks for the effort and thanks everyone for attending. I, you know, I enjoy it. Yeah, thank you so much. So again, uh, Matthias, thank you so much. Please stay healthy and uh, see you soon sometimes. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.